RF man here. Today I'm going to continue my discussion on load sharing. I mentioned that in the video when I talked about how to filter high frequency noise and switching noise from the output of a power supply. We talked about using a common mode choke. We talked about using an LC filter. Um, so I'm going to just follow up today on that and talk about load sharing. So I'm using the same setup here. I got the same 12 volt power supplies, about 2400 watts. I got the same load resistors. I'm using the same boost converters here. I'm using these to convert 12 volts to 50 volts. Now with that said, you can go ahead and apply this methodology if you're using several 12 volt power supplies in parallel or 50 volt power supplies or boost converters, doesn't matter. Okay, it's the, same, it's the same methodology that's being used. So before I demonstrate the before and after results, I just wanna talk a little bit about how we do this. So here's a drawing I made up. It's an example of three 50 volt 10 amp power supplies in parallel. And if I make no special provisions in the circuitry, what you'll find is one power supply will produce all the current or most of the current and the remaining power supplies will just stand there idle. You'll have very, very little current being sourced from those power supplies. And the reason why it has to do with the regulation loop and you don't have to be a power supply expert to understand this. Um, I happen to have some experience in power supply design in an earlier life. So I did some switching power supplies and high voltage power supplies. So I'm pretty fluent in this. But uh, just high level, the power supply regulates when there's a voltage drop that occurs. So if the voltage is set to 50 volts and I start loading the power supply, then there's a sensing element in there. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, and it senses the voltage drop. Okay, and that sends an error signal to the pulse width modulator, right? It uses a PWM as a uh, switch mode power supply control circuit. And what that does is it, it takes that error signal and it increases the conduction time of the switching transistor. Okay, so typically for each DC output, you're gonna have a winding and a transformer, and you're gonna have a, a transistor, probably a MOSFET, that's switching one of those windings, okay, to produce a certain voltage output. So what happens when you load the power supply? Well, the pulse width modulator just increases the width of the pulse that's driving that transistor, okay? So we, we call that conduction time, and that in turn increases the voltage output. So when you have one power supply that's regulating and keeping the voltage at 50 volts, the remaining power supplies don't see the drop therefore don't regulate and as a result don't produce any substantial current so it has to do with the regulation loop okay and you'll have some variation between power supplies of course not all the circuits are identical because of component tolerances so here's a setup and what you see here is i'm using three resistors 0.1 ohm resistors to isolate the output of each power supply this way, the power supplies can operate independently and the control loops don't really see whatever power supply it might be. We'll call it power supply A, B, or C. Okay, they don't see the, the voltage level of the power supply that would normally source all the current because they're isolated by these resistors. So this helps us balance the load and if the power supplies are adjustable, and, and most are, we can go ahead and adjust the DC output to evenly distribute the current. So if I'm drawing a total of six amps without using some type of circuitry, then one power supply might, might source 5.8 amps and the other two maybe 100 milliamps each. Okay, so if we isolate them and we use the adjustments, we can go ahead and balance the load so the load sharing would then equally distribute the current. So ideally it would be two amps for each power supply, right? Two, four, six. So that's typically how that works. So if I zoom in on just one of the power supplies, you can see I'm using a 0.1 ohm 10 watt 
okay and if you do the ohm's law calculations you're going to find that each branch is is actually producing about 8.3 amps so let's just do some ohm's law here okay ohm's law 101 the total current would be i equals e over r right so 50 over you notice here i got a two ohm load so 50 divided by 2 is 25 amps right and then with a parallel circuit, ideal parallel circuit, the current is divided evenly across each branch, right? We have three branches. So that's why you have 8.3 amps. This is the same with a parallel resistive circuit, no different. Okay, so then if we look at the voltage drop across each resistor, we'll call that ER1, ER2, and ER3, right? Then E equals I times R. So we will have a point. 83 volts across each of the resistors. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but at, at 8 amps, 8.3 amps, okay, P equals E squared over R. So there's basically E squared. Okay, R is only 0.1, but look how many watts. You get 7 watts across each of those resistors. Okay, so like anything else with design work, there's, there's trade-offs. You're, you're going to be dissipating some extra power there, about 20 extra watts, but it'll address the load sharing problem and make this a practical solution. So when you're looking at your design and your power supplies and your loading, go through these simple calculations here to make sure you're selecting resistors that have the right wattage rating. Otherwise, you're headed for a little trouble. So now we're going to look at the before and after and see what we get. All right, so now we're going to look at the load sharing situation in practical application. Uh, probably most of you know that it, to address this problem, it's good design practice to adjust both power sources to the exact same voltage. That's what we have here. You can see 50 volts. I've adjusted each one of these independently. You see the potentiometer right here that's used for adjustment. So you can adjust the outputs independently, get them exactly the same, and then use the same gauge wire, the same length wire, the same terminations to your load. Okay, so this is also important, but it's probably not going to address the load sharing problem completely. Okay, so let's take a look at that. All the terminations are exactly the same. As I said, wire lengths, gauges, everything is identical here, both on the input side, which is less critical in this case, and the output side, right? So now you can see my output's 50 volts, my input 12 volts, okay? I'm using this multimeter with a fluke current gauge right here, snap-on current gauge. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this on the first power supply. You can see the output there. Okay. And let's go over and look at the current. Okay. Look at that. No current. Interesting. And yet my loads are, are really heating up here. So we got current somewhere. Okay. Now let's go ahead and snap it on the second output. Okay. You can see it there on the second output. Okay. Now let's go here. Okay, and you can see we got to carry a decimal because I'm basically 10 millivolts per amp. Okay, so 5.3 amps. Okay, so you can clearly see in this arrangement, even with the output voltages adjusted independently, so they're both 50 volts, and even with the identical terminations, I still have a significant load sharing problem. So now let's see what we can do to remedy that. Okay, so now what we've done, as you can see here, we've added a point, one ohm. These are five watt. I'm not testing these on the full load. They're being tested about half load. So now you can see I added a point, one ohm, five watt resistor to each output. Okay, and I got a slight drop, 
in the output voltage you can see there I'm trying to zoom in okay 49.7 that's perfectly acceptable okay but now we're gonna go ahead and look at remember this power supply was doing none of the work right well if we go back over here now I see that's drawing about 2.6 amps okay and we'll remove the current probe we'll go ahead and put it on the next and that one's about 2.69 so not bad not bad it's very very evenly distributed just by adding the 0.1 ohm 5 watt resistors okay so remember go through ohm's law make sure the resistor wattage rating is adequate um, you can use a 0.2 but you know ohm's law you're going to increase the drop across the resistor so you're going to increase the power dissipation even further okay yes the total uh, the total current might drop slightly but the voltage drop across the resistor is going to increase and that's going to almost double double your current double your power so I like to stay with 0.1, maybe 0.2 on the outset. And uh, incidentally, you can also do this. Let's flip the page here. You can all do, also do this by using diodes, blocking diodes. So you can see here, identical circuit, identical configuration. You can go ahead and use blocking diodes but the diodes have to have the right current rating uh, typically in a case like this you can use maybe two six amp diodes in parallel uh, the current for each diode will not be evenly distributed but it'll be close enough shouldn't give you a problem I went ahead and tested that with this cry dome we'll take this out here and get a better look at it with this large cry dome diode of course it's well overrated and it does work. It works just fine. Um, there's two diodes in there. Um, they have a combination of two or three. And that, incidentally, is typically used for redundant power supplies. So, yeah, Crydome makes a solution for that with a two diodes or three diodes, even four. So, that's another approach. You can use regular diodes, put them in parallel. That's referred to as oaring the diodes. And that works as well. So I hope this was informative. I showed you the before and after. It does work. It's, it's quite effective. And uh, it's a good solution. And it's a cost-effective solution. So again, we can use this approach with these boost converters, 12-volt power supplies, switching linear, doesn't matter. Okay, RF man. Thanks.